So I'll start with you, Jürgen. How worried were you in the first half? It looked as though it was going to be a disaster. Yeah, I was a little bit nervous at halftime, really, to be honest. <laughs> it didn't look so good. But then, obviously, the second half um, was tremendous. I mean, they forced kind of the equalizer. They threw themselves into that game. They, they really fought for every single ball, every inch on the field. They were feisty. They were going into the one-against-one one battle. They, they adjusted to the circumstances there in San Pedro Zula. Mm -hmm. And then once they, they, they got their goal, the equalizer... Um, they were really then controlling the game and dominating. I mean, Greg Bealder made the right adjustments for the second half. They brought, he brought in the right people <laughs> as well. You know, it worked out just perfectly and uh, uh, it ended up in a tremendous big, big win. And uh, I think that calms everybody down now. Um, it was well-deserved. Uh, they really can enjoy that moment because to win in Honduras in such a place like San Pedro Zula is, a, is very rare. <laughs> so, so you got to take that all in. And congratulations to them. It was awesome. Uh, what were your thoughts on it, Ale? Well, it was doom and gloom going into halftime. So you have to say that the most important 15 minutes of Greg Berhalter's tenure with the national team was not on the field. It was actually at halftime and making adjustments and making changes and recognizing, you know what, whatever we are doing is not working. And so, to his credit and the credit of his staff, they were able to come up with the decision to change the structure of the team, change the formation, bring on the correct players, bring on the players that would make a difference and make an impact, give the team a little bit of a different structure, a little bit more certainty as to what the jobs of the players was on the field, a little bit more clarity. But they were not alone in this. There's a big, and I mean a big, big, unlikeliest of helpers here, and that is the coach of Honduras, Fabian Coito who for whatever reason, his team was dominating the United States, they were playing with confidence, they were playing with certainty, and he decided, you know what's a great idea here? We're gonna change formation, we're gonna change players. And now his team that was so confident in the first half, now in the second half they were searching. They didn't know what to do, they looked like the United States did in the first half. So credit to Berhalter, credit to his staff, more importantly credit to the players, but then you have to ask huge, and I mean huge questions to Fabian Coito, who nobody here in the United States wants to talk about, but I have to tell you, you watch this game, and it's not only what the United States did in the second half, it's also what Honduras did not do in the second half that they were doing so well in the first half. Uh, with that in mind then, Casey, what did we learn from uh, this performance for the U.S. men's national team? Yeah, I think that's a, going to be something that Greg Berhalter is going to be looking over uh, as, as he reviews the tape, not only of the Honduras game, but also of the previous two matches. And the, the, the tough part that you have is any kind of new coach who comes into CONCACAF. You have all these matches before qualifying starts, and almost the majority of them, of any matches against CONCACAF opponents, are going to be in the United States. Okay, you had the Nations League, you had a Gold Cup, but it's all home games for the U.S. And you have a group of young players who none of them have, have or the majority of them have not been in World Cup qualifying experiences. And when you play against an El Salvador away or you play against a Honduras away, it's a different match in World Cup qualifying than it is in either a Gold Cup, a Nations League, or a friendly. And so Greg Berhalter and his coaching staff are going to have to figure out which of those players they can count on in those difficult environments against these different higher intensity matches. And so I think it's still a learning process. And these three games have been crucial for Greg and that coaching staff to realize what players he can count on in, in those environments. Uh, Ian, commentating on a match like that couldn't be much fun if the U.S. did go on to lose, right? Well, uh, we've grown used to the inquest. You remember the last campaign which ended so calamitously with a, a failure to get to the World Cup at all, which is unthinkable. That cannot happen again. I think there's a lot of young, talented players coming through for this team. What they don't have yet is that experience of being able to grind it out in those tough away games that Jürgen and, and Casey have been telling you about. It's a different game in those matches, and they're going to have to learn very fast. Happily, last night, the lesson was learned in time, and they changed that game around. And, and what a night, by the way, for the 18-year-old uh, Ricardo Pepe 
to score on his debut and to play such a big part. So there are fairy tales in this, but there's a lot of work still to be done. I think the USA will do it. They have got a lot of gifted players here. They just need that little bit more experience and belief, I think, for it all to flourish. Well, Ian just mentioned him, Jürgen. 18-year-old Ricardo Pepe. How impressed were you with his performance? Yeah, no, it couldn't get any better for, uh, for a young kid to come in and then score the equalizer in such a big game and get that experience, you know. And, and I think, you know, the, the growth that this team is now going through over the next 16, 18 months towards Qatar um, will be super exciting. I mean, obviously, they are not a finished product yet. You know, many of them, you know, it was the first experience, you know, the, the last couple of games in World Cup qualifier. But with every game, they're going to get more mature, they have kind of more knowledge about the circumstances of CONCACAF and the difficulty of these specific games. And, and they, as Ian said, they, they have to learn really quick. But I, I'm very confident that they're going to learn really quickly because um, they're playing in their club environments. They now, it's a good mixture of European-based players and MLS-based players. Um, and they seem really to get along as a, as a group. And I think the, the backbone, or we call it kind of the spiral of the... Of, of the group, you know, with maybe starting in the back with your John Brooks and Tyler Adams and Weston McKinney when he comes back, then and obviously Christian Pulisic. And then you surround them with all these youngsters that, you know, have no fear. And they showed absolutely no fear um, in the second half in San Puerto Zula. And that was really fun to watch. Um, there will be only kind of growth uh, as a result of all of this. So I'm, I'm very positive for this group of players. Obviously, a lot of positivity surrounding mm. uh, young players like Ricardo Pepe. Is that a problem now? Will there be too much pressure put on him? Well, this country, is, this soccer country, if you will, is famous for grabbing a young player and crowning him the next best thing. So quickly we do that here in the United States, and so desperately. It may just be time to just kind of calm down a bit. Just relax, observe the player, appreciate the growth and the maturation of Ricardo Pepe, and appreciate what you have. But you have to nurture this talent, and you can't expect him to be the savior of this squad. Now, they have a lot of positive signs, and Pepe is one of them. And Brendan Aronson, his level of energy, I think, makes a difference for this team. And Sebastián Leget did a great job coming off the bench. And, and, and I think the list goes on on young players that you can get excited about. But if we're going to talk about experience as one of the issues that this team does not have, then you also have to mention, okay, John Brooks, you're going to just mention him as the part of the spine of the team. His performances have to be better. What he did against Canada in that goal, unacceptable. What he did in the goal against Honduras last night, also unacceptable. Gets himself out of position, gets turned in, in the attack in half, and it's late to react, getting back into a position where he can defend. George Bello, also late to react. So those are things that, while we can get caught up on the excitement of Ricardo Pepe and Brendan Aronson, and whatever else you want to bring up and say, hey, that was great in the last 45 minutes, you also have to evaluate the big picture. And the big picture is that if this team is going to be truly successful, that spine of the team that Jurgen is, is talking about will have to depend on a better performance, on the best version of John Brooks. And we haven't seen that yet. It, the question was going to be who was going to play alongside John Brooks. And now you also sort of have to ask the question, well, is he the answer? He has to be the answer because of his experience. But given the performances, it hasn't been great for him. And you can say the same thing about other individuals within this team that are supposed to bring the experience, and yet you're leaning on the young guys. It's, it should be the other way around. Would you agree with that, Casey? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with Ellie. I, I thought John Brooks, uh, who you know I cover in the, in the Bundesliga quite a bit, has, has played extremely well for Wolfsburg. And I've been surprised that, that maybe the national team performances haven't equaled the club performances. And I would love to see him get uh, more consistent in his play for the national team. Uh, you know, also, you, you talked about the young players, but then who did, who did Greg have to bring on? He had to bring on Sebastian Legette and DeAndre Yedlin, who both contributed extremely well in that second half. Uh, you know, obviously, Anthony Robinson, who's, who's gained a lot of experience over the last couple of years at Fulham. So it is. It's, it, it's interesting that some younger players got the opportunities and then some more experienced players came off the bench and, and, and got the job done. So 
it's back to that question mark that I think uh, Greg Berhalter has is, you know, what is this squad? He's, he's really used a, a ton of different players in both Nations League in, in uh, Gold Cup. And now he has to really figure out who he can count on going forward in, in World Cup qualifying, that he doesn't necessarily have 35, 36 players to choose from. He's got to pick a, a, a real small core, get that spine, as, as Jurgen mentioned, uh, working at its best. And then when you are called upon to have to bring in some different players, uh, hopefully they can perform at the level. But to Ollie's point, you can't be counting on young, inexperienced players. Those experienced players are the ones that have to guide your team going forward. So how does Berhalter manage that, um, Jürgen, going forward with an eye on the World Cup? How does he find the balance between those young players and the more experienced players? Well, I think, you know, I mean, Greg knows that better than we do because he's on the inside of it every day when they are in camp. But it is really, really important for the next 15, 16 months going towards Qatar that you have, you know, um, a, a, yeah, a set of players, I would at least seven, eight um, core players that run the show. And I think he has in, in mind those seven, eight players. Then you build another four, five, six around them with the highest quality possible that you can find, no matter if they're in Europe or if they're in MLS. Um, and then you, you build the roster a little bit bigger. Obviously, you have then 23 players that, that will join you then to, to Qatar. But I think, you know, the earlier you decide on those seven, eight core players, the better you are off, you know, because they need to to build an understanding, a blind understanding on the field and also off the field. They need to drive the energy of the group. They need to make sure that if somebody steps out of normal, like maybe an example of Weston McKinney now, that's actually an issue that should be solved by the players themselves. You know, I had, you know, incidents like that um, also as a player, you know, with teammates and, and we didn't even ask the, the manager or the coach, you know, to solve that issue. You know, we, we took the player on right away and, and put him in, in his spot. Um, so all these are things are basically the dynamic of that team, the chemistry of that team will now develop over the next 15, 16 months in a very rapid time, obviously, because they come in and out for these 10, 12 days and then they go back to their club teams and, and boom, I mean, in a, in a heartbeat, you know, we are already in Qatar. Um, so that's, I, I think that's a big challenge now for Greg and his staff. Uh, but I, I just think that it's a very, very positive start now. A bit of shit, yeah, a bit shaky in, uh, here and there, but it's it's also normal. You go to El Salvador, you go to Honduras, very difficult places to play. You know, you struggle a bit with Canada at home, but it's not the Canada anymore from ten years ago. It's a different Canada that you play right now. Uh, obviously, with an Alfonso Davies as their superstar, similar to a Christian Pulisic on our end. So, I mean, overall, five points out of the first three games. You're right in there for the race to Qatar, and uh, and I'm very positive about this development. Uh, well, the next three-match qualifying cycle comes in October, and this is what is ahead for the U.S., Jamaica, followed by Panama, and then Costa Rica, and then later in November, it's Mexico and Jamaica. So, Ian, upcoming games that you see there, are they out of the woods, or is there more danger ahead? Well, I think you've got to take every every step as it goes. I think we learned the last time not to take too much for granted, and I don't think anybody will again. Obviously, that Mexico game is a huge one, but it's not about winning the group. It's just finishing in the top three, isn't it? Then you're automatically at the World Cup. And I think the point Jürgen was making is a good one, too. They've got to get a pretty settled team quite quickly, I think, now, because this World Cup comes around in 14 months' time. So you can't be chopping and changing and, and uh, dealing new cards into the pack um, very late on in the piece. They've got to find a team that not only gets to the World Cup but can be competitive with the likes of Italy, Spain, Belgium, England, Brazil, Argentina. That's the, the big, big step, and that's where the USA's progress will be measured. Casey, is there any fear that lightning could strike twice and they don't make it? Well, okay, you saw the first two matches in this group in the first half against Honduras. So, if, of course, you have to think that that's a, a possibility uh, because I think after the successes in the summer, I think we all figured, or, or at least there was the, the collective mindset amongst the the United States fans again was that, oh, not only are we going to cruise through qualifying, but we're going to start looking at, at, 
at rounds beyond uh, in the World Cup. And, and it just shows you that you can't do that in CONCACAF. It's a, there's some tough games, particularly in World Cup qualifying, and the U.S. has to play better than they did in these three matches to make that a reality. And, and so, yes, th that's a fear. Now, I think that Jamaica game, I know I love how Ian's already looking forward to that Mexico game, but to me, you're looking at Jamaica now with one point in three games. That's a must three points at home. If, when you play that next game in qualifying, if you want to be legitimate about qualifying and not get stuck into some, you know, get sucked into some vortex at the end, three points against Jamaica is vital and then move forward from there. Well, thank you very much for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming, premium content, and let's not forget as well, ESPN FC, seven days a week. Subscribe to ESPN Plus.